So, there is a maxim in writing that says, write what you know. And don't worry, this, this will bleed into Planet Zoo. But the point of that maxim is to direct your attention to what you know. Now, the thing is about that, much like most of the writing maxims that you'll get handed in the early parts of attempting to write or, or in your school studies, is that they're kind of useless. They tell you things that you are already fully aware of and are not particularly helpful. Um, and this is certainly one of them. Really what we say, well, really what we should say instead is understand what you know. And if you don't know something, learn more. And I think that that in many ways is, is far more helpful than trying to assume based on what you already know that, that you're just going to magically pop out something perfect, right? If you don't have experience in something, you can always gain more experience. That's one of the beautiful things about human growth. So why do I start with this? Well, first off, um, welcome back to Jack's Coffee Break. My name is Jack. And today I want to try and talk about how I start to get ideas and build architecture in Planet Zoo. This is sort of a weird way to start things, I know, um, and we're going to take a little while before we get into the, into the game, but um, I think that this is a good place to start. Um, so we will eventually get into the game, don't worry. But this is going to be a long video, and if you need to take breaks, go ahead, and by no means think of this as like the ultimate guide or a, or a how-to that you need to follow. This is my process, and it's what works for me and something else is going to work for you. Um, so I'm hoping that this helps to give you some sort of inspiration or jump off point. But I mean, really, you know, this is, this is how I do things and I hope that it is at least useful. So as we're spinning around the globe, one of the things that I'm thinking about when we look at something like this and when we go into Planet Zoo and we start a new park is where in the world do we want to be? For Planet Zoo specifically, I no longer think about where the the specific park is, and I think about it in terms of like a template, a shape, a texture, a color, sort of abstract. So I may click on the temperate Oceania map, but that's just because I want an island. You know, it's not anything to do with the fact that it's going to be temperate or Oceania. And you can pull it in different directions based on how you manipulate your terrain, your architecture, and things like that. So for today's video, I'm going to start with what, what I do first, which is I figure out where in the world I want to be. Um, and instead of zooming in on, on Google Earth, which we will do in a little bit, um, I'm going to start by going through all the things that kind of come to mind for me. So first one for me is Japan. Um, Japan is one of the first countries that I started to learn about outside of America. And no wonder, I, I grew up in the 2000s and, you know, a lot of kids' cartoons, the good ones came from Japan. <laughs> So it, it, no wonder the interest started to follow. But in starting to learn more about Japanese architecture and how these houses are built, we start to see that there's commonalities in their shape and their form. Their roofs are always extremely distinctive. They have this sort of white and wood style um, that we're going to see in other places of the world. In a lot of ways, there's certain pieces of or certain concepts and ideas of Japanese architecture that you can plant anywhere in the world. And depending on what you strip away and what you add, you could convincingly make it fit that part of the world, you know, instead of being in Japan. Like this, this is very much so a more of a modern house style. You know, you've got a sliding glass door, you've got glass windows, um, you've got your basic slanted house roof. The addition that makes this so distinctly Japanese are, are these roof plates right here that you can actually see the beams and of course this little spike through here. If we go to something more like this, these curves on the roof are what really highlight it. And thankfully Planet Zoo gives us all of the tools that we need in order to build these styles of roofs. Of course, to code it further, you know, we might look at something like one of the traditional arches, um, which I have a picture of somewhere in here. This is a little bit closer. You see what I mean? This isn't this isn't one of the, the traditional arches, but you get the sense. So here it is. This is what I'm looking for. And these all indicate very quickly, hey, we're in Japan. But unsurprisingly, when you have cultural bleed, you're going to get 
things that are, are blended across different places. For example, over on the main continent, if we look over here at Nepal. Now there are some things here that make this distinctly Nepalese. Their roofs do something different. Um, we have this building right here, which is far more in line with something Indonesian or possibly even Indian. It's very well built up. It's got these little ensconces around sort of a core. It's highly detailed. The colors are different, the terrain is different, and these are all based on environmental factors that simply don't exist in Japan or, or anywhere else in the world that are going to affect how your architecture starts to look. And picking out all of these different nuances, things like the temperature, the humidity, the weather patterns, the geography, what materials are around, start to give you a sense of where a place becomes real, where it's growing out of its environment. And this is really handy for world building, which is a large part of what we're doing in Planet Zoo is we're building a world. Now, yes, it may be set in a zoo, but that is kind of sort of the framework that we're using. It's the narrator of the story. Likewise, you can see all of this wood and a lot of this plaster. And if we were to go to somewhere like Germany, all of these things are gonna feature again, but you're gonna start dealing with different roofs. So here I have Munich and a, a little bit of um, that really famous castle that starts with an S that I'm blanking on. But like, if we look at this picture through here, one of the things that you'll notice is it's very geometric, but we're still dealing with whites. We're still dealing with woods. And if we were to go to something more rural in Germany, you know, something like this, we're still starting to see kind of that, that reoccurrence of the wood and all of, all of those, the, the white. Um, in this case, it's going to be a plaster. Um, this will be wattle and dorp. So getting sort of these ideas of where we want to take things, you know, this on the surface is very distinctive, but there are things that we recognize from over in something like this. You know, the geometry is, is based in making things a little bit more symmetrical. Whereas in this old Germanic style, that symmetry is there, but there's a lot more diagonals, yeah? There's a lot more stone. The materials that we're using are thicker, they're denser, they're weightier. And so this is something else that I consider is sort of the, I, I call it the weight of the, of the building. But something that you'll notice about both of these two houses is that they feel very warm. And part of this is in the textures that we're using. So wood is a very soft material and it's a very warm material. And so incorporating wood into your builds is going to give it that softer, warmer, more comforting feel. So where we start to get away from something like that is if we were to go, let's say back to Munich and we start to look at, let me get a nice big picture. So something like this. So this is a very large, heavy, imposing building. It's got a lot of detail. It's got a lot of surface structure. And you'll notice that we're not using wood. We're using plaster, concrete, stone. And what this is going to do is it's going to make the building feel heavy, um, partially because it is, but it's going, to, it's going to cause that sense of weight on the viewer. And the incorporation of stone and the fact that we're staying with these sort of white muted pastels um, or just straight up whites and grays is going to give us a colder feel. So this is a, a more cold, a more imposing building. And we get senses of warmth by the addition of surrounding neighbors. For example, this bright yellow over here is helping to contribute to a more warmer feel in this building, but seen in isolation, it would not feel that way. And if you were to go touch it, it would be cold. The denser the materials that you're using in your buildings, the more cold the region is, the lighter, the airier, the more likely it is to be a warmer place. But of course, there are exceptions here. For example, let's go to this oceanside town over in Greece. So we're still using thick, dense, heavy materials, but we're brightening it up. And you can see just through the sheer amount of windows that we're getting a lot of airflow. So this is taking materials that would otherwise be kind of heavy and cold, and we're adding airflow in order to let those warm breezes in to sort of warm these areas. So the, the denser the material, the more warmth you're gonna trap. The thinner the material, the more air is gonna flow out and the colder the space will be. But a lighter area can indicate that the temperatures are more temperate. And so you want that airflow. Heavier materials indicate that you're trying to keep the, ins the outside out and the inside in. The use of color is also very important. Which colors are going to use your temperatures? 
all contribute to a sense of being a warmer or colder place. For example, this village right here, um, once again, also in Greece, we're using bright white plasters and bright blues, and they complement the ocean quite beautifully. It's, it's very evocative of the ocean. You have the sea foam and where the ocean meets the sky. It's quite artfully done. I think that this might actually be a resort. Um, but because we're using bright blues and, br and bright whites, this space feels much colder than anything else in the picture. So this kind of concept of temperature and weight and feeling, airflow, um, all of these things are going to contribute to essentially a kind of style. And even though in Planet Zoo we don't really have the ability to experience any of those other sensory things, we really are relying entirely on vision and to a certain extent sound, all of these things are starting to paint us a story based on our own physical experiences. So another one that we can look at, you know, we're looking at kind of this cliffside village and, and how they've built up around the terrain. So they haven't terraformed nearly as much. You know, they're, they're not leveling this out and making this a, a flat area. They're working with the existing terrain and yes, they're carving away at it, but you know, it still gives us this sense of height and it, it's contrasted by the flat plain of the ocean. But another place where we might see this is something like the Pueblo cliff dwellings. So this is an ancient remnant of a civilization. And there's a lot of theories as to why they built their cities into these cliffs. Um, one of them is invading Aztecs, of all things. <laughs> you wouldn't think that the Aztecs made it that far up north, but they did. And so it's possible that the reason why they built up in these cliffs was partially for airflow and partially for safety. So this gives us a sense of history, of storytelling, of, of why the civilization exists the way that it does. And you can kind of start to see this whole cliff is going to cast this area in darkness and shade. And because we know it's in New Mexico, it's in the desert and it is hot. It is so incredibly hot. It can get up to like 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd be about like 40 or 42 Celsius, maybe a little more. It's stupid hot. <laughs> And so having all of this shade and putting your city in a place where there's a breeze makes this place more habitable, more livable. The way that adobe and stone is formed is once again to try and keep the environment out and to keep air in. So if they're capturing this cold air and they're able to move it around, these buildings are actually going to be quite livable compared to anywhere outside. So we get this sense of like, again, sort of a, a cliffside dwelling that sort of faces out into a plain, but that plain is filled with rocks and trees. Everything above it is filled with rocks and trees, and it gives us this kind of squished feeling. It feels a little bit trapped, a little bit condensed. Like there's nowhere to expand to but out, and they keep digging in. In a sense, it's, it's very evocative of something like the dwarves from fantasy. On the other hand, we have something like Machu Picchu, which once again is another cliffside facing dwelling, but they managed to build a gigantic city on basically a mountain ridge. You're not worried about airflow up here. It's going to come to you whether you like it or not. And so they're able to build with all of these thick, dense stones. And if you actually to go visit Machu Picchu, they don't use plaster in order to glue these together. They cut the stones to fit each groove. It's just really cool. It's different ways of, of problem solving similar issues. What this tells us is something about the people. So, you know, in, in more European style cities, they're going to glue everything in with mortar. And so the stones just need to be good enough. With something like Machu Picchu, where every stone has its place, and if any stone is removed, the whole becomes weaker. It tells us something about the mathematical precision and the economy of resources. It tells us something about their psychology, essentially. And so all of these different ideas are, are all sort of where I start to take inspiration from. You know, if I'm going to start a zoo in, let's say I really do want it um, to be like in, let's say Germany, you know, one of the places where I might start is, is I might look at places like Munich. I might look at old German architecture and that's going to give me the sense of style that I want. You know, but maybe I want to pull more of those fantasy elements. So maybe I'll look at, you know, German fairy tales and folklore. I'll look at the building materials. I'll say that I want something more old Gothic, you know. You know, let's say that I really am wanting to go ham and I want to build something this style. So how do I take this 
and apply it to everything else, you know? So what I might do is I might look at this building and I'll say, okay, so there are these sharp turrets that gradually thin out that end in points. And I'll make that a motif across my zoo. So I'll incorporate it into the walls. I'll incorporate it into the buildings, um, into some of the decorations, you know, things like that. So this is where I start to get ideas, but once you're actually in the game, all of these ideas are great for starting things like your layout and for your large buildings and for where you want your habitats and then eventually determining what animals. You know, if we're going to go for a German zoo, maybe I'm going to rely more on the Europe and the Eurasian animal packs. You know, there's there's some base game animals that I might include and I, I might say that one animal that otherwise wouldn't be there, like for example, the Asian small clawed otter, we know that there's otters in Europe, I might say that it's this other species. Or if I'm feeling really risky, I might download a mod. But this doesn't necessarily help us for in detail. So this is where we're gonna come back to, to Google Earth and I'm gonna zoom down and just for the sake of example today, I'm gonna look at Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a very strange city. Everybody knows it as like the city of lights. It, it's the place where you go to gamble, right? But what you may not realize is, you know, the relative si size of the city is not really what you expect. And the amount of resources that it takes in order to make the city function is ridiculous. For those of you who have played um, Fallout New Vegas, you actually get a pretty good sense. You get a pretty good sense of what living here functions on, what it actually takes. Um, so, for example, we have you know this lake through here, Lake Mead, and it's blocked off down here by the Hoover Dam. And outside of this, we really don't have a lot of natural water because it's a desert. But we know that Hoover Dam is is basically our power generation center for the entire city. Right. If we come over here, this is what's making this work. So when we look at, New at Las Vegas, we're, we're going to be looking at things like, you know, the tourist district, the, the city of lights that it is. Um, and I may be calling it the city of lights, even though that's that's Paris, but it is. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and, and pull up some some generic pictures. You know, this is what we think of right here. So bright lights, palm trees, LEDs. And this is where I start to think in detail. So we've got kind of our grand picture out of the way. So we know, you know, this is going to be the style, the theme, the layout, but where your zoo comes to life is in the details. So being willing to spend, you know, zoo space on this sort of green area in a desert, which is already like, how, why are you doing this and how? You're already thinking about your resource requirements and, and starting to think more, more realistically about how the infrastructure is holding this up. But then dedicating a green space with basically nothing else, the highlight is the grass, and then this focal point, this sign. So we have our palm trees, which are shockingly water intensive. And of course, you know, the sign itself very square simple metal beams painted blue this very iconic shape to the sign the typing um these lights and all of these things are things that you need to individually create in planet zoo so you know we have the leds to make a welcome to las vegas sign we have the bulbs we have all of these materials but you know then you need to go in and you need to physically make the sign and that's where the detail really starts to build up in Planet Zoo. And it starts to make it a more deep and complicated game. So here's another one. So this is sort of an aerial layout view. So we have these hotels, we have this image of the main drag, we've got the, the famous Paris replica, um, a Eiffel Tower replica, we've got sort of a, a Ferris wheel, which is meant to ev evoke the London eye. And then we have this giant lake. <laughs> so much like in Planet Zoo, what we're looking at is a tourist area that is expertly laid out in which every single piece has been designed by a person and that somebody had to make physically happen. And this is very much, it, it is exactly like building in Planet Zoo. So one of the other things that I think about when I start to work on a, a zoo that I'm going to build is the amount of effort, the amount of time that I'm, I'm going to use. And this goes into project management. This goes into our project management video. So then we start to look at the details right where are these streets flowing and what are these streets telling us we can see from these little tiny dots in fact let me go ahead and see if i can open this in a new tab just so that way we can get a better view 
these tiny little dots are, are cars. So we know that these lines of traffic are going to be like, what is that? Six lanes wide, five or six. This is not a place that is walking guest friendly. So instead we have these overbridges that allow you to safely get from point A to point B, despite the fact that there's a freaking highway running in the middle of the place you want to walk. There's a roller coaster. Why is there a roller coaster? Because it would be enjoyable to guests. It will bring in money. There's your logic. So one of the ways that we can kind of think about this in terms of Planet Zoo is that instead of this massive road being a highway and these walking bridges being for humans, let's say instead that these are paths for our guests and that these walkways instead are for our animals that connect one habitat side to another. So that's how we can start to get more of an idea of of how we're going to apply our themes and our details to our layout is thinking about these functionality things. How do we want the animals and the humans to, to live together in harmony, you know? Um, how do we want to attract humans to different places? Well, when we look at highway flow, which is again, a really nice analogous thing for our paths, they're leading us to these different cordoned off sections. And the value of these sections is going to be dependent on what is held within them. So for example, if you're really intent on going to this MGM building right here, you're going to have to use, if you're coming from this direction, you're going to have to use this highway and then you're going to have to turn into the smaller thoroughfare in order to get into a parking lot to get into this MGM building. To think about this in Planet Zoo, if your guest entrance is over here, your guests are going to have to walk all the way through here and then you'll probably want to take them to an offshoot path in order to get to a viewing area for a habitat. So let's go back to Google Earth and let's just go ahead and plant ourselves somewhere. Um, I think over here looks like a great place. Um, and yes, I am taking us to a neighborhood. So looks like we're not going to get many walking paths. I would like to set down like right here, but I don't think it's going to let us. Let's go over here. So here we are in this neighborhood. So again, Las Vegas, you know, we think of the glittering lights, but in order to make a place like that work, there has to be enough residential for all the people to actually work on the strip. There needs to be grocers, there needs to be people who work at the power plant and all these other sorts of things besides. So this is what builds up our economy. But in Planet Zoo terms, what we can think of this as is backstage areas. Where do our staff need to be? Where do we need to have our keeper huts? Where do we need to have our veterinary clinic? And all of these items can be as small as the buildings are in Planet Zoo, or they can be as large as you want to, to make them. But just looking around this random neighborhood, one of the first things that we notice is this style of parking garage. So this tells us quite a lot. We already know from the fact that it's Las Vegas that they're not getting a lot of water, right? They're not getting a lot of rain and the rain that they do get, it's not gonna be so much that it's gonna start to cause damage. Really what these are for is to keep the dust off. So they need basically to be very simple because they need to be cheap and economical, but they don't need to be much more than that because the weather and the, and the dust and the requirements around here just don't ask for much more. So then how would we start to build an item like this? You know, we'll focus on the beams, we'll focus on the overhangs, we'll focus on the depth. And this gives us a very simple structure that we can very easily replicate in Planet Zoo in order to get those details. What's really gonna matter is the textures that we're using. So we're gonna wanna use things like corrugated metal for these roofs, and then maybe some iron beams. Or maybe use some of the painted wood, but it's painted so heavily that it can really become anything. Same for these power lines, you know? We start to focus on on how they, they curve and how they triangle. And the fact that this isn't a true circle, it's a whole bunch of flat plates put together. Where are we breaking up our sight lines? So we have this wall right here that separates this apartment complex from this neighborhood. It acts as a property line, but if we were to think about it again, um, in Planet Zoo terms, if we're saying that this is gonna be like a walkway, then this might be the back of another exhibit and this could be the front of the exhibit that you actually want to go to. So let's zoom out a little bit. So these are going to be kind of our, our low volume, low traffic areas. And we can start to use sort of these inspirations for our backstage areas. But let's say that we wanted to go to something where, you know, you might actually want guests. So let me see if I can find the main drag. So here is the front of the Las Vegas airport. 
it's not a whole bunch to it's not a whole lot to look at but one of the things that we start to notice is that when we build up this building we can replicate all of this with plaster almost one for one and you basically don't even need to leave the grid what's really going to give it the pop is these little stone details the words the lights and the vents otherwise this is a rather plain building so you really depending on what you're building you don't necessarily need to over design your buildings right you don't need to make incredible use of architecture you can do simple things um, and just add a little bit of weathering a little bit of detail what does catch our eye however is the the gardening that they've done over here so this is where you know this plain white building is getting its pop of color so we've got a little bit of our sedge we've got our saguaro cactus we've got what could be analogized to be a desert ironwood, um, short little palms, little square bushes, and it's very sparsely decorated, but it's getting the job done. Um, and it's all about how we're laying out these individual pieces. So this starts to give us an idea of like how we can lay out our green spaces. Um, for a desert, you know, it makes sense to do things kind of sparse and have each individual item stand as its own object. Whereas if we were to go to Let's just go to a completely different part of the world real quick. So we've jumped places in the world and we're now in Rowlett Park in Florida. So this is a highly manicured area. Most of Florida is, is jungle, um, evergreen swamp, um, things like that. Not, not evergreen swamp, Everglade swamp. But in this sort of manicured area, you'll notice that we're using a lot of big trees and we're using a lot of grass in order to cover up all of these areas, but it's very bright, it's very bright, vibrant. In this kind of manicured space, we're using something similar to the, to the desert template, but the second that you look anywhere outside of it, the sight line becomes completely obscured by just the sheer density of trees. So this might be one of the ways that you get more of a manicured feel in a tropical area. Let's go ahead and jump to, um, here we go. So this is a, a portion of Everglades National Park, but the rest of Florida looks like this. So it is completely covered over. Lots of grass, which then is broken up by very short palms, which is then broken up by very tall palms. So we're getting this sort of layered sense of density. Um, so when we start to look at our, our tropical zoos, when we build in our green areas, we can start to follow this sort of patterning. So we lay down a blanket of something thick and dense, and then we increase the height as we go towards the focal point of the landscaped object. Um, and then another thing is the use of statues. So I, I love to use statues in a lot of my zoos, and I, I get that idea from gators. So this is a normal site in Florida. Um, I mean, it's not that normal. There's a lot of them, but there's always one. You can assume that if there is a body of water, there is at least one alligator in it. I'm pretty sure I've talked about that on the channel before. Now in Planet Zoo, it doesn't make a lot of sense to make your entire zoo a gator habitat. A, it's a risk to your guests, but B, it's not realistic. What you can do instead is you can use the statues that we have in order to create little areas where the you, you're implying animal life to be. So that's one of the other ways that you can start to bring life to to an area in detail is to use the animal statues in order to give it that sense of, of nature residing. Um, We've got the little seagull item that can give you a sense of birds being on roofs. So we're starting to analogize. So let us finally, finally get into the game. So here we are in what I'm what I'm basically calling my, my modern zoo. And really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking all of the things that we've seen from like looking at Google Earth, looking at Google at, at all the pictures and taking all of these ideas and I'm playing with them. So this is this is a sandbox in the sense that I am literally using a sandbox to play with ideas. So breaking this down, uh, first thing I started with is I knew that if I'm going to make a modern zoo, then I wanted to incorporate modern art and modern architectural art, I guess. So I started with something like this. So I'm playing around here with other things that I've I've seen in like modern art exhibits um, from walking around. C cities have a, just a ton of this stuff. Um, so I'm using things that I've seen either in real life or through Googling in order to try and replicate and come up with my own style for like, how would I do modern art? How would I do these expensive mega installations that really serve no purpose except to look. And so I came up with something like this shape, um, which is really just three objects that I've twisted into into various things. Another thing that I've looked at is 
this would be, for example, um, a set of exhibits. So I have no idea how you get in here. That's something that, you know, is a problem that I need to solve. Um, but I've created this sort of template on the floor that I've used for the ceiling in kind of this, there's a name for it. It's a Irish try something, but it's also very evocative of leaves. So that's something else that I want to incorporate. I've thought about color and material. Um, so for example, this is actually a wooden arbor panel and it's lined by concrete. Um, so this took a lot of time and a lot of use of curves and, and all that kind of stuff. But you know, once you get the outline done, you, you basically just fill it in. And so it gives us this nice, massive viewing area. And what we do with the inside is sort of up for debate. So for example, um, one of the things that we can do is we can disrupt our path space. So for example, right now, all of this is traversable. One of the ways that we can lead guests through is to create islands in each of these that sort of direct the flow of traffic. Alternatively, we could do a single center piece that then pushes guests into each of our little viewing areas. And then through here, we would do some kind of habitat or set of habitats. And under here, I might use this as a guest area. So this is one of the ways that I've started to do things. Another one is to try and play with abstracts. Um, so I've got this sort of clover here. It's a five leaf clover for reasons. But I wanted to play with the idea of phases of the moon for something like a wolf habitat. So I've started to build this. Um, and that's what all these circles are, is, is phases of the moon. And the idea is that as the sun passes through, so as the day passes through, we get different instances of, of the moon phases until right about here, at like four, four, no, let's see, 12, one, two o'clock. This whole bit right here shines light down um, and we get a really good sense of these moon phases. And then of course at night, the idea is that you'll be able to look through these up at the stars. Now, of course, that will depend on how this is implemented. Do I want to put this on a hill so that way you can better see the stars through it? Am I even happy with this design? You know, right now it is a little bit plain and a little bit empty. And you can start to see where I've blocked off areas for the habitat. So for example, up through here, um, I'd put some kind of standing area for the guests. Underneath that is going to be a quiet space for the animals. Through here, I might do some kind of staff buildings, or I might make this another piece of a habitat. Um, this might be an entire walkway. Uh, this this could have another building on top of it. And I don't really know, but I, I just want to play with these ideas. And then over here, um, so I'm building a, a building based on African wild dogs. So I've got these little statues that I've made out of the uh, Australia pieces. And again, I haven't really done anything inside the shells. That's always like the most time consuming for me. But I've used the aquatic pack pieces in order to replicate the colors of, you know, an, an Australian wild or a African wild dog. Um, and I've used these slopes to give the building this kind of a critter sitting kind of feel, like almost as if these are paws and then these are ears, in order to try and evoke something more animalistic. And most of this I'm doing through things like shape language. Um, if we look at it just through here, it kind of looks a little bit like an angry owl. Um, and again, we're, we're sort of using a little bit of, of human pattern recognition as well. But the main feature that I've been dancing around is this gigantic building. Um, so I've been trying to teach myself lately to build big. I'm used to building very small, very cramped, and to stuffing a lot into a tiny space. And while that has its merits, sometimes it's good to just expand and let things sort of play out and exist. Um, so for example, I have this park through here. This is one of the ways that you might enter through the zoo. There's a whole bunch of landscaping that needs to happen through here, but for right now, this is kind of simple enough. Your focus shouldn't be on this green area. It just needs to be functional enough that you read it and you say, oh yes, this is a city park. This is a blueprint from off the workshop because I hate building kids' playgrounds. But you know, so this gives me an idea of like, I want a playground through here. And it just adds to that feeling of a city park. And then we have these city tour buses, which are going to be another way that the guests actually get into the zoo. But so yes, the, the main 
the main focus that I was working on through this is, is giving myself a lot of space and working in size. Um, so I've got a fairly large map. I'm using the, the basic temperate, um, European temperate, I think. And you can see that it doesn't take up the entire footprint. Like, um, there's another building that I've worked on, that, that night house um, that I think I've showed off in other episodes. It doesn't quite take up that amount of space, um, but it's, it's fairly large. Um, so one of the first things that I focused on was how you get off the street. And really there's, there's two ways into this building. Um, the first one is to come up these stairs, uh, which I framed in concrete and of course we will decorate. Um, if this were truly in a city, then we would expect things like probably a little bit of graffiti, um, something that hasn't been washed away yet. There might even be, considering this is an art museum, um, purposeful like graffiti and decorations and things like that. And then down into here, you would have a parking garage um, and same for this other side over there. So if we come up the stairs, however, one of the things that I've done, especially with this facade, is to break away from flat surfaces. So this is um, a little bit frustrating to do in Planet Zoo, but as long as you work on your 15 degree angles, it's, it's fairly doable. I've created these metal structural beams that kind of support this angle. Um, and then up here to this, this flat sort of minimalist design, and we're working with a lot of metal. A lot of metal, a lot of glass, and that, that is very indicative of the modern architecture. In here, I don't think we'll get any Australian viewers, but if we do, you might recognize this as basically a one-to-one -one rip of the Melbourne um, Museum. So over here I've got their museum shop, I've got these big stands, and the way that I've done this is I've, I've gone into Google Earth again, I found this museum, and they have a walking tour, which was actually really cool. And I've done my best to try and replicate it one for one. And this area through here functions as an entrance hall, but it's also a entertaining space. So this is a space that you could rent out, put tables, um, and then have like, you know, parties or corporate meetings or things like that. Um, over through here, I've got the museum shop, which I will be decorating using the, um, or in the facilities, we've got the, uh, the new like build a shop pieces um they're they're somewhere in here uh here we are so the modular souvenir shop stuff so that's what i'll be using to decorate this space um couldn't find a whole lot of good pictures of it but what i was really entranced with was this sort of hanging walking area and then i i don't know what i'm gonna do exactly for the roof and then of course this also this hanging walking area so this would go further into a museum there'd be a in the in the original there's like a paleontology section there's an art section um and really what i just wanted to use was this entrance building um so i have i'm i'm using old pieces that i've built before so these stairs i ended up building for uh one of my uh contest exhibits the one for gariels um and i'm just using those here again i've got this little green space to add pops of color and life and then over through here is sort of our first museum exhibit, so this is going to be like, you know, Ice Age uh, creatures. Um, and I did not build these, these are from the workshop. Um, let me see if I can find who from Mammoth Bones. So I can't find it right now. Hopefully I will add it either on screen or in the show notes. Um, but yeah, so just starting to decorate through here. And this, this has taken a shocking amount of work. So I know that it's very plain and empty through here right now, but this has actually taken me like <laughs> weeks to build, um, a really long time. So the other thing that I, I was thinking about is how on earth are we getting up there? So I built another staircase. Um, so let's just jump down there, explore mode, go here. Um, so then we would come up into here there's this hallway that we've built, um, so you can look out on everything. And because we're using so much glass, even though this building is fairly large, it doesn't, it doesn't feel heavy in the way that a lot of other architecture can. Um, just because of the fact that we have so much access to the outside world, it makes it feel lighter than it really is. So then there are a couple of ways that you can get out into the rest of the zoo. So there's this like underground walkway, um, and then there's 
this overhang walkway that you can get on from the second floor. And then there is, um, basically it connects into these tunnels down here. And this is where I've, I've started to landscape and this will be our first habitat. Uh, so right now I'm thinking probably monkeys um, or orangutans, great apes, something like that. And the whole idea is that this is going to be a big bamboo, grassy, sort of beautiful area that as you walk into the zoo, it makes it feel a little bit less open, but like you're walking into a jungle. Um, so it contrasts very heavily with the outside world. And that's kind of, you know, I've, I've named it the Museum of Living Arts, and the, the whole idea is that the animals are the art. I know, pretentious, but that's the point of doing stuff like this. So uh, this would be more habitat. I was thinking maybe lions, just because I can. And these would be walkways. And then I've, I've used hedges, um, and again, sort of using this staircase idea and sprinkling in different plants in order to make these green spaces. Um, and I'm very careful about where my trees are growing. So in real life, we'd have landscapers who would prune this tree to, to make sure that it stays out of the walkway. In Planet Zoo, we don't have that luxury, so we just kind of have to do the best that we have. So there's gonna be a little bit of clipping, but this is basically the start. Um, and like I said, it's enormous. And even though it doesn't look like there's a whole lot here, this has taken months because this is individually built piece by piece and I'm using the grid as much as I can, but occasionally we do have to leave it. Um, so let's go look at something a little bit more finished now. Alrighty, so this is Kirschwald Zoo. Um, this is my first ever zoo that I, I really started building. Um, I did play around with the game before, had to leave, and when I came back, this was my first mega project that I really stuck with, that I was really in love with. So I started with the European taiga map and spent forever carving out this water to give us this little island, and then came through and did all of the landscaping for it. So building up this mountain, um, building up these different little plateaus, um, carving out these different areas. And this took a long, long time. Um, and then the water has been a consistent source of problems. And we'll talk a little bit about that because it's worth it. Um, incorporating and, and figuring out how water fits into your zoo is, is a huge deal for me in figuring out what I'm gonna even do. Um, so we'll give, it a, we'll give it a talk in a minute. But this is our entrance island. It's very well carved out, except for over here well, where we stop carving it out and just let it be natural. And like I said, this is basically where I where I started. So you'll notice that there's a lot of workshop items and a lot of base game blueprints. Assume that unless I specifically point it out to you, I didn't build it. <laughs> cool? All right. So first things first, plaza layout. Um, so when I started with the zoo, I was taking inspiration from the fact that the European pack had just launched. And my, when, when I was younger, I went on a trip to Germany, um, specifically Bavarian Germany. And it rapidly became one of my favorite places in the world. It's like my happy place. <laughs> it's that and Poland, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And, and specifically, uh, there's a, there is a specific city in Poland, but those were the things that I really wanted to draw on for the experience of the zoo. And we are going to lag. I'm so sorry. It's just, it is what it is and we're going to stay in pause. So one of the things that I knew was that I, I wanted a heavy emphasis on trains. So this is our first train station. I looked around at a lot of different train stations that were on the workshop and I tried to build my own with this massive thing. So there's gridded pieces. You'll notice that we're sticking with this kind of spar lumber. Um, and I learned to do that based on ripping apart these blueprints and then sort of trying to apply them to my own stuff. Um, we have a token bit of greenery just to like add a feel to it. Um, we've got what I think were going to be lights that I faced the wrong way around. And then um, I talked about the use of statues. So this is one of those places where I was like, we need something in here, let's use statues. <laughs> and didn't really think about like, why I was using those statues and, and what I needed them to accomplish. I just knew that I needed something. I spent a lot of time getting this whole pathing situation to work. So that way we could come up onto our train station. And then of course this side is where you leave. Over here, this side 
I've used these, uh, the barriers, the security barriers, because all of this is a singular path unit. And so this just forces the guests to actually respect that these are doors. Um, and again, use of statues and a little canoe, or uh, not a canoe, gondola. And it gives it this kind of grand feeling. But I haven't done anything with the paths. <laughs> I haven't covered them up. I haven't made them look good. Um, it's a shell with decoration and not expertly applied decoration. But this, again, this is to show you where I started off. Um, and then this habitat over here, I was thinking to myself, well, we need something really basic and simple. And so I added peacocks. And you'll notice immediately that this building style has nothing to do with the rest of anything else we're gonna do here. So I've added some little exhibits. I've added peacocks. Um, this space is tiny for them. I wasn't really good at trying to figure out how much space I needed things to, to have. And again, you'll notice that I rely a lot on the grid and then just sort of try to decorate. Um, and then this is our, our staff facility for the things that are, are going on on this island. My original plan for the layout, besides the fact that I knew that I wanted this entrance plaza, was my dream was that everybody would have to board the train in order to cross to the island. This didn't work for obvious reasons. Um, the trains just don't have a very high capacity and I didn't want to load this thing up with trains. And on top of that, getting getting this train to work at all took a lot of doing. The, um, the ride system is not intuitive. It's a holdout from Planet Coaster, but they stripped a lot of the functionality that game had and it made it very frustrating. But what I, what I wanted through here was for this to be a wildlife preserve and then to have a small village over here and then I knew that I wanted something over here, so we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. This might as well be its own park. But I wanted to build this up to be a, a wildlife preserve where all of the animals could roam freely, where there wasn't a lot of staff management. And it didn't work because I didn't understand the mechanics of the game very well. I gave it the best shot that I could. What I, what I ended up realizing very quickly is that the constraints of the animals' group sizes effectively limited what I could reasonably do with them. So my secondary option was to find the group sizes of the animals that I wanted. So that was gonna be um, the deer, the ibex, and then down below, I know at some point I went with bison. And my hope was that they would all have these little tiers that they could live on. And then I realized that I was going to need to separate their enclosures into these little sections, these areas, and that I would end up with dozens upon, well, not dozens, but but about a dozen on each of these layers of repeated habitats, essentially, in order to try and get what I wanted. Because I didn't understand how the null barrier worked, and I wasn't sure how I was going to contain all of these different animals. So the goal was for this to be a massive landscaped area, but I, I quickly realized that the game wasn't going to let me do that just because of, you know, the requirements for the animals. So I ended up stripping everything out, absolutely everything. And I ended up rebuilding with this sort of town through here. So this isn't a true train stop, um, but I kind of wanted it to, to feel like that. And this was the first large building I, I ever built. Um, I put a lot of time into it and I tried to decorate it to the best of my abilities. But really what I was basing it off of is this building right here, which is off of the workshop. So this is a, a wonderful example of like that nice old German architecture. We've got the medieval banners. We've got these beautiful light posts with the candles really well decorated and the layout is quite unique. So we've got an exhibit through here, we've got a staff building through here, um, we've got some bathrooms in different places. So food court. And the idea was that this was gonna be somebody else's entrance, um, but they put it up on the workshop for anybody to use. So I try and adapted it to what I could, what I could do with it. So I cleared out the ticket booths through here, I tried to line up the paths. Yeah, here's the bathroom through here. Beautiful use of stained glass. And so all of these different motifs are what I was looking at when I tried to build this. And I did okay. Um, I like it. I think it holds up. It's, it's fine. It does what it needs to do. 
Um, now some of this I have I have just ripped from other buildings. Sometimes I've I've made bits, uh, bits and pieces of it myself. But the main thing that I really wanted to focus this on was um, when we went to Poland, we went to Krakow. And one of the things that really stuck with me was in the center of the plaza was this giant kind of market. And I wanted to incorporate that into my build. And so that's basically what I've built. Um, we've got all these different concessions through here. And the idea was that this was a kind of, it was a sort of Christmas marketplace, but when we went, it was not Christmas. <laughs> So you could you could buy those like decorated eggs and things like that. And I wasn't used to building interiors at this point. So I kind of just slapped lights where I could and did my best. Um, and so it's not incredibly well decorated, but it suited what I wanted it to be enough. Where I really ended up focusing my efforts was on these outside buildings and this layout. And then as you pass through on the train, because the idea is that the train will take you through here. So I've got these little polar bear lights, little medieval torches and things like that. And of course, as you're going through on the train, like you don't want to give them too much to look at. But again, this is a little bit plain. Um, you can see where my roofs are sticking through. So you can see all of these different places where if I were to go back today, I'd probably refurbish this. Um, I'd use cladding in order to create, you know, actual room for those to be in. I might add a little bit of greenery um, or some, you know, fake snow or something to give that area a little bit more life. But for what this was trying to be, it did okay, you know? Um, and this was the first time that I, I was really trying to build in detail. Um, and so I spent a long, long time on this. And then over through here, this was my first real experiments with a pathing and elevation. It's very square, very blocky. Um, I ended up creating my own kind of bricks. Um, so this is kind of like a, a single unit that's on the grid and then I've layered bricks on top. Um, and again, a lot of use of existing blueprints. A little bit of practice with uh, rock work through here. And this is sort of the quote unquote Africa section. That's what this eventually became. And you'll notice that they're very sparsely decorated. There's not a lot of unique landscape stuff going on. I haven't used rocks very well. I tried to incorporate a little bit of like water, um, different viewing platforms. And so, you know, the bones of exploration are here, but it's, it's tripped up by the fact that I'm using four wide paths. And so this place feels very, very cramped. It's very tight through here. Um, in fact, let's just go into explore mode so you can kind of feel. So yeah, very, very tight, very narrow, not cohesive in the slightest. Um, this was very much a, I'm building an African section and so therefore I should use African and Australian parts without thinking about necessarily how that would feel with the fact that this is supposed to be a Bavarian zoo. I'd seen some tutorials about using these faux trees um, as sort of a, a rock wall. So I practiced doing that a little bit with this. I've got an area for my rhino. He gave me a lot of problems. Hi. And I wanted to focus on the African animals that I that I really liked. So I, I knew that I wanted a rhino because I'd never built for one of those. I knew that I wanted Nile Edgeway because they're my favorite. <laughs> no explanation beyond that. I've got some, some paddocks for some addacks and a few other animals. And they're just sort of very tight and plain. Maybe the most unique feature is this sort of badlands thing that I've done in order to cover up the fact that there's a water treatment plant down there. And one of the things that I was really afraid to do was to fully hide all of the, the staff facilities and mechanics, like all the all the mechanical stuff for like, you know, you could still see the guest barriers, you can still see the water treatment plant. And this is this is primarily because of my ADHD. I didn't trust that I would be able to remember for myself that, hey, this is a water treatment plant. So instead I built around it, but kept it visible. Over here is where I tried to go a little bit more European with it. Tried a little bit of decorating through there. And the goal was to make this feel like, you know, we've sort of slapdash something together for these penguins and it, boy, does it feel slapdash. Tried to work with adding a little pool down here. That was another attempt. So this zoo was a lot of firsts for me, um, including this bridge over here. So I think I did end up making this myself. 
I think. I, but I think I also ended up ripping like parts of it from a blueprint or something. Um, like one of the New World blueprints. It might just be a New World blueprint and then I, I spent like hours trying to figure out how I was gonna get this path to curve. And I, I ended up like kind of hamming it a little bit. So it definitely functions, but you know, it's not, it's not astounding. Yeah, I think this might actually be a new world. Yeah, it's a new world building large. So this is a blueprint, um, but then I spent a whole bunch of time just trying to make it work. So like I said, definitely a lot of firsts. This whole thing, um, this used to be an area for buffalo, ended up bulldozing it, moved the buffalo over there. Whoop. So now we've got the buffalo over there, ended up separating out my pronghorns from the buffalo because the diseases were just too much. Um, we've got some caribou. Um, or did I? No, they might... No, they're... No. No, I think I did separate them out. And I still wanted my deer, um, so I added a little place for the deer through this, and I, I made it a, a huge meadow. But finally we get to this city up here. And the main thing that I was focusing on was, like, working with the landscape. So I knew that I wanted to contrast the two different kinds of brown bear that we had, so that's sort of what this area is doing. And that was like a central area, but I didn't know how to blend it in with the rest of the city. Here is one of my first attempts at landscaping. It's a little bit crowded. It's a little bit, like it's very colorful. Probably could have toned this down a lot, but I, I wanted this like layered, bright, colorful feeling. And of course, gotta have them deer statues. So attempted to build just a, like a basic train stop. Um, and I wanted to do more with it, but I kind of ran out of energy and gave up. <laughs> Next thing over here, again, sort of ripping blueprints and trying to mash them together, kind of. And all of these places feel very, like, tight together. There's a really famous photo of a German town where, like, if we come right here, um, one side goes down a hill and then another side goes up a hill. Uh, if I can find it in post, maybe it'll be on screen. Maybe. Probably not. Um, but it's like a, it's one of those really like famous pictures. And I wanted to try and replicate that through here. And it took a lot of finicking. So I spent a lot of time focusing on these. Um, and then by the time that I got to the buildings, I was like trying to do my best. Um, this one I think was custom. And it was so large. Um, and it really didn't feel like it fit with the rest of the blueprints that I was using to just flesh out this area. Um, again, a lot of duplicate uses of animals. So right here, I, this is actually, um, we'll come back to this. I started with a pair of links and I thought it would be really cute to put my lynxes in a castle. So I did that. Um, we've got blueprints through here. Um, tried to make this structure myself. Um, this is ripped off of one of the maps. And then here's my, my lynx habitat. So I wanted to make it nice and green. And during this phase, I, I really could not care less about the guests. I just wanted something really nice for the animals. So I did my best to try and make this a, a green space. Um, and then to focus on how the terrain navigation worked. Ended up with a lot of traversability issues. So the lynx has kept escaping and then coming down here so that's why there's all these spikes through here and i just used a thing that looked like a spike um there are more efficient ways to do that but it took time to learn i've got a little mural of uh <laughs> yeah um little lynx trying to hunt a very terrified deer i don't know why they look like that they do and then this um is a a later rebuilding of an old deer habitat so I wanted these tunnels and my hope was that, no, this is goats, sorry. My hope was that the goats would be able to hop across from one side to another. Of course, I've also got this gap back here. So you can kind of see, like as I'm explaining it, I, I'm hoping that you can kind of get the sense of the layers of, of how I grew and developed as, as a Planet Zoo builder. I started with a lot of blueprints and then the few things that I felt confident in, in building, I, I gave it my best shot. You know, something like this. This little stage and auditorium where, like, maybe they put on shows. I eventually got my lynxes to 
to breed and I wanted to keep the offspring, but they don't like friends. So I built another castle for them. And again, this is, uh, if we go into here, multiple layers of traversable space. Wanted glass so that way, you know, the guests could see them walking across. I'd see that done in other places. Tried to make this 100% traversable for the lynxes. And it, it gave me a lot of difficulty. So that is the core of Kirschwald and how it kind of started and evolved. Um, this area through here really hasn't changed much over time. This dock has given me the most amount of trouble I think I've ever had to deal with. But overall, like, you can kind of, the you can start to see the growth rings, um, in certain cases, literally. And then the last thing that I knew that I wanted was I wanted this massive, like, Disney-style castle on top. So I, I bricked it out and then promptly lost energy. So I needed a break, but I didn't want to leave the zoo. So over here is my canine park. Um, and this is just a whole zoo for canines. So I knew that this area was a little bit sparse, but I didn't know how to landscape. So I just kind of threw down plants and hoped it looked good. <laughs> um, again, really didn't know how to decorate for guest areas. So I just sort of started where I could and laid things down. Um, I knew that I wanted this to be kind of a natural park area. And this, this habitat right here for African wild dogs is where I really started to get an idea for how habitats get constructed and, and how to start to use the null barriers and different heights and, and other things that, you know, we've talked about on this channel before. This is where I started to learn that. So we have this whole African wild dog exhibit through here. It's very sparse. It's a little bit more like Italian countryside and not Africa. Um, and I do have a story for this zoo about that, but I won't relay that to you. And then this back here is my African wild dog retirement home because there was not yet a rehome feature for elderly animals. But I'd completely run out of land space and just could not get the sizes developed enough. So I ended up building these platforms in order to increase their land area traversability. There's nothing in here now. I think they eventually did die of old age. But I tried to give them the happiest life I could. Um, through here, I tried to replicate kind of more of like a nature park. So here's some camping tents. Um, I've used some food trucks in order to set up little stalls. Um, but I'm imagining these to be like RVs. These little brick houses and and spikes for reasons spikes for reasons just trying to decorate this out and then again still still relying heavily on the blueprints to try and make this kind of like a cabin area but this is for staff and then another little temp ground over here which is a little bit more military and this was a attempt i made at a campfire so I've used sticks to try and cover over the uh, arctic torches, um, the torch brackets, so that way this is kind of on fire. It works fairly well. Um, I did eventually learn how to do that a little bit better. Over here we have arctic wolves. So I knew that I wanted a little bit of underwater viewing, but mostly what I wanted was to have these little ice paths so that way the wolves could jump around on them. And it kind of worked. This little niche green space, again, was a, a large experimentation in how on earth do I get paths to work. And then stadium seating, which I've never gotten the hang of. Um, and you can see that I've, I've actually bothered to decorate this area with like plants. Um, I'm using borders. I'm not completely overwhelming the space with color. This is definitely a later addition. And then over here, um, so I wanted them to have this cave, but I also wanted them to be able to get up to this area. I still didn't know how land traversability worked, so I ended up using these little wood pieces in the hope that, I don't know, they'd have attraction to be able to climb up here. And they, they do occasionally come up here. It's okay. And then down here is um, our guest viewing areas, which are all right, you know. So a lot of stonework, a lot of framing. This used to be macaques. So originally I had a massive macaque habitat that spanned this entire walkway as you came down this hill. 
It was really high up. And the macaques became such a disease issue that I decided to go full in on just having every dog here. So this is now a dole exhibit. Um, this again, I think is a blueprint, but it's a very cool one. So I wanted to include it. And so I did. And that is the logic of a lot of this. You can see that I'm still using um, the basic barriers and that these are about to break. And there were a lot of places where I just couldn't figure out how to get parts to work. So I ended up using the barriers instead. And this sort of cliff type thing is one of the first things I did. That is an alarming number of wolves. <laughs> this looks weird. So you can see where I'm starting to get a grip on how habitats work. Starting to work on overhangs, starting to add rock work. Don't really know how to rotate my rocks yet. Wanted a big old wolf statue, so I found one on the workshop and I planted it somewhere. <laughs> um, and then I, I wanted another train. So I, my hope was, and you can see me starting to build it through here, that this would be like a massive, like, valley between two cliffs. And that it would be just chock full of crystals that you would have to basically ride through as sort of an attraction on this train that would eventually go through here. Still have no idea what I'm gonna build with this. And the zoo is now so large that again, it's lagging my computer in pause and I've done everything that I can to try and reduce it. Over here, I wanted to build the globe theater. Just, just the whole globe theater. Because why not? Um, this was really my first experiment in circles. So originally I had done this all up. Um, there were pathways, there were all of these different stands. And my hope was that you would be able to come into this little circle and you'd be able to have a show where you transport animals into this little theatrical area. And then the guests would be able to watch as if like in an auditorium to learn more about the animal. And like my goal originally was lemurs because there's a black and white rough lemur and he, he looks like a Shakespearean actor. So this was kind of my first experiment in circles. Um, obviously it didn't stay. I ended up giving up on this idea. Mostly because um, the issue with the electronics was causing too many problems. It was one of those cases where I'm, I'm building very ambitiously but I'm not working fast enough to make the management side happy. And the last thing I did was I built this little island through here and it's gone through a lot of iteration. So I've got polar bears. Um, one of the things that I figured might be a suitable answer to the fact that they require just so much space is if I could get my guests to come down through here and then pop up in a little igloo type thing um, in order to be able to look at the polar bears up close. Did I accomplish this? Absolutely. Does it look good? Kind of, I guess it functions. Over here, again, more experiments in rock work, blending different styles of rock, adding ice, adding snow. Um, and this is for my gray seals. By then I'd, I'd finally gotten a grip on how docks work. So this is an example of that. All these different guest and staff areas. And of course I ended up having to build a bridge in order for you to get here because otherwise this was just gonna be a secluded little island. And I didn't really want there to be a bridge to here. What I wanted was for a boat ride to go around this entire zoo and for you to be able to stop off at all of these individual areas. So there'd be a stop over here and a stop over here and one over here and one over here and on the backside and then probably something over here and then have like a no man's island. Like, I don't know, this is just where we exile the bad staff and the bad animal. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it was gonna be here. It was just gonna be an exile island. So this gives you, I hope an idea of like where I started, where I, where I tried to play with these ideas and eventually ended up shelving this because of the fact that it got so unwieldy on my computer. Um, not because I don't, want to build on this map, I do, my computer just can't take it. <laughs> so I ended up having to give up on it. So let's progress into the future a little bit. So this is my New Vegas Point um, or Mojave Heights Zoo. 
And um, it was definitely... Like, the core of this zoo has become the rock work. But when I started it off, I had a completely different idea for this zoo. My original goal was that I'd, I'd build a zoo as if it were in New Vegas. Um, like, Fallout New Vegas. And clearly that didn't... <laughs> That didn't happen. I wanted to have city sections, I wanted to have run out buildings, um, and I wanted it to feel like you were walking through the Las Vegas Strip in Fallout. Not a one for one, but like a, like take those concepts and apply them, or apply them to a zoo. Like I said, it didn't happen. Um, what I did do instead is I, I built a big old desert zoo. Um, don't mind this guy, he's a blueprint, but he's a super cool looking blueprint and I want to highlight him. Um, I don't know who made this. Hopefully your name is on the screen. But look at this freaking cool T-Rex. <laughs> and I, I wanted him in the zoo, so I added him. Kind of experimented with adding a parking lot. It's taken me a long time to come around to, to adding things like parking lots. Again, it's taking me a very long time to care at all about the guests and to think about them even a little bit. Um, and this was sort of the baby steps I took was to give them a whole parking lot and to try and incorporate this bus. So you come into this welcome center. Um, this is basically a, it's a staff area with a, th a little like entrance. Um, and my hope was that these would be ticket booths. Um, unfortunately, that's just not how Planet Zoo works. You don't buy your tickets at a stand. You just magically have them and you go through this like turnstile thing. And this brings you out onto this opening area. So, despite the fact that I showed you in, in Kirschwald that, that there was a plaza, that was a case where I was trying to build a city inside of a nature preserve. This is a case where I'm genuinely trying to build a zoo. And so this is the first time where I've actually built an entrance plaza of any notable size. Most of the time you walk in and boom, an animal. Because that's what I care about. But it's not how zoos work, is it? And that was something that I was really trying to study. Again, we've got this very framed cliff thing going on. I've really leaned that into that in my architecture. Um, and this zoo has an egregious amount of it. You'll, you'll see. This is also where I'm starting to learn how to use sight lines. So especially here with this Przewalski's horse. So if we go down into explore mode, um, I th this might be a blueprint off the workshop. I don't know what that is. Pretty sure that's a blueprint. Pretty sure I didn't build that. So I wanted to start working with sight lines. So I wanted there to be a barn. I knew that I wanted there to be horses and for there to be water that goes up into, into somewhere else, um, starts a green area. And I knew that I wanted a shelter place for my horses, um, but that it wasn't the focus and that it would be off in the distance. Um, so I built these big old rock structures and have been using them sort of copy paste around the zoo. You'll, you'll notice them quite frequently now that I've pointed them out. And then I built this kind of corral space. And this is basically their private area, their, their shelter when they need to get away from the guests. Um, you'll notice that I'm using a lot of illusion tricks and I'm focusing a lot on what the zoo looks like from ground level rather than flying. So this whole area through here looks ugly because why bother decorating it? It functions when you're on ground level. The illusion is preserved, so why do more? And that is gonna start to... It's a blend of themes. I do that quite a lot nowadays, but I also try and incorporate like the full 3D realism. Over here, we've got like a little fox exhibit. This is a, a newer edition. And again, I'm still not really happy with my habitat landscaping. This is a better example. Um, here I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted it to be. But in other places, you'll note that I'm just sort of making it work. Um, over here is my mixed wildebeest habitat. So I've got black and blue wildebeest in here. Really wanted to play with height. And this is the edge of my zoo. And for some reason, I thought that the world border was like right here. <laughs> Realized that it wasn't, came back, added this river so that way they'll quit jumping out. And then again, using sort of this mud pillar technique. Um, and I think these again might be off of the workshop. I know everything in here is. The other thing I wanted to do was figure out how a walkthrough exhibit might work 
with guests and with wallabies where they're actually inside the habitat. Um, and so this is kind of a, a view that I had specifically imagined for it. I wanted you to stand down here and to look up and to see the wallabies as if it were kind of a, like an IMAX show almost. Um, and I really wanted it to be shade, like very shady and with a lot of trees. But the wallabies needed more space. Um, they needed more quiet places. And so I ended up building this sort of rock tunnel through here that only the wallabies are ever going to use that goes to their staff building. And again, this is this is me trying to experiment with the idea of adding real staff areas, like dedicated backstage areas. So again, I've got a pool. This one's a whole lot better than my first one. And again, I'm, I'm playing with kind of color and, and texture and lack thereof in certain areas. So this is another place where like I had a vision for the animal and where it started to conflict, but I figured out how to make it not conflict. So this is a space for um, Maine wolves. And they live in these beautiful, grassy, like, realistically, they should have 100% foliage tolerance, and for some reason they don't. So I said, screw it, <laughs> and built them a grassy plain. And I, I tried to figure out how I was going to get people from this side of the zoo to this side of the zoo more efficiently while traversing this. So I ended up with this kind of crosswalk area. Um, by this point, I'm starting to attempt building my own railings. So this is an example, sort of sticking with that original idea that I mentioned earlier, um, that it didn't really work out, the idea of having different like themed areas of leaning into that kind of Las Vegas style. Um, I did try and do that a little bit through this region over here. Um, so this is a lot of the times when I've when I've designed these habitats, I've I've had an image in my mind um, and usually it just sort of happens like I don't plan for it. I just think, hmm. I want a habitat and then an image will flash into my mind and then I, I get to work trying to build that and usually it'll be based off of things that I've either seen before or trying to piece things together and so this is one of those so I have these big gaudy golden temples peacocks and all kinds of stuff um, that are trying to frame out this area and ideally what I would have is back here there would be a massive cliff and waterfalls running down it um, that was a lot of effort, so I never got around to it, <laughs> but, uh, what I have through here is I've got this mixed habitat, capybaras, anteaters, and more, um, maned wolves. So, or actually, I think one of the only canines that you can house in, sort of, in a mixed species habitat safely. Um, so I wanted to take advantage of that. Um, and a lot of everything that's happened over here uh, has come about partially to keep the capybaras in and partially to keep the jaguar out. So up here, I have a jaguar habitat. Uh, here is my boy. There he is. Um, here's his little cave down here. Um, and it's got a glass wall just in case I decide that I want something back here for guests to view into. Unlikely that that will happen, but you know, an option. And then more of like keeping water behind uh, different areas so that way I can... It's basically like a like an easy way to keep animals tied like in, in their enclosure. Um, keeping these flat of course works as well. So this was one of those areas that um, was a lot of fun to build but a little bit difficult. This is another one of those cases where I've got this this water wall through here and then I've created little breaks where I want the water to flow down from. So I've used effects um, and I've underneath all of this rock work, of course, you can see the glass poking out. Um, and then as we go over here, um, this whole area was directly inspired by an actual zoo, um, the San Antonio Zoo. They have this really cool kind of stony area um, where you're kind of walking through this kind of a rock tunnel gorge thing. And it's very atmospheric um, and they've got like clouded leopards and stuff. So I wanted to replicate something like that because um, as I was building this, I'd just gotten down from a trip to there. And so over here, I've got my cheetahs um, and I'm not terribly happy with how sparse this is, but again, they're hard to decorate for just because they don't have a lot of tolerance. Um, and then up here, excuse me, um, we've got a little bit of concessions. And then coming down through here, we get into sort of the tunnel walk. I'm just gonna skip through um, more viewing of the cheetahs. 
And then as we come this direction, uh, it's quiet, it's dark, it's in the shade. Um, I mean, like, it's going to be a little bit loud just because of the people talking in it. But, you know, it's not quite going to feel like it, it does, you know, outside of this tunnel area. And I want to give the guests areas of shade because it's going to be hot. Um, and you want to try and prevent heat stroke as much as you can in your zoos. So this is another place where I've, I've, unlike the cheetah habitat, I've severely restricted the viewing space. So this is basically the only area where you can view in to see the armadillos. It's a very small habitat, and I've used some mixed stone techniques for the facade in order to give it this different feeling. Um, so we've got kind of the shale feeling through here, the rock pebbles, the heavier rocks on top, and then it, it feels like it's sort of in this enclosed alcove. And then of course I've got my armadillos in here. Going back through the, the wall, over here we have my caracal. Um, so this was a lot of fun, this whole area. It was a combination of having to work with constraints already built up through here. Um, so this rock wall is going to abet uh, more of our, our habitats. And this one I wanted there to be a good amount of viewing, because again, it's going to be kind of a high traffic animal. But they really don't tolerate a whole lot of foliage. So I ended up going with a lot of frankincense trees and not a whole lot of ground cover. Um, just a couple of nitarias, and then some walkways and climbing spaces. And up there a little bit you can see the guards to make sure that they stay in the habitat. So the viewing is a little bit more restricted. Um, I'm trying to keep it to these specific angles that I think would be the best for viewing. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that you can always see the caracal regardless of like, you know, you'll have to walk around the habitat a little bit, but it will be in view is kind of the goal there. And then this leads, um, here's, well, here's another viewing area. This leads out um, back over into our uh, jungle area. So this all is abutting right through here. And this tunnel is stretching through this space, coming around over here, um, making an S bend, and then coming back out over here. So I functionally built like a, a sprawling pathway framed it as though it's a building with these different areas around it but instead of making it a, an actual building i've just made it out of rocks yeah so this is this whole zoo it's not very big um and i'm i'm don't want it to be i'm pretty close to done with it i've got like one or two habitats i want to add and then i think i'm gonna call it so let's go ahead and move on shall we Alrighty, so we're pretty close to the modern day, um, as I think you can probably tell. So a lot of those rock work techniques um, that I started practicing in that last zoo um, eventually bled into into some of the stuff that we've we've done over here. Um, and I will after after the next two, I do want to briefly talk about another way that I've learned to develop my skills. Um, but we'll get there. So I've developed this kind of shale technique, um, and I've seen others use it. Like it's not unique to me, but. I did end up like putting it together without a guide. Like I found this out the hard way. There are way easier ways to figure this stuff out. So I'd, I'd started to develop the shale technique and then through here, um, I'm starting to use this kind of triangle overhang. So we looked at that armadillo habitat and I wanted to mirror that, but make it larger. Um, um, I had tried this previously in a, in a different map, liked it and started to use it here. So we get these, these nice, overcroppings that sort of hang down um, and they're they're kind of mushroom like um, but I, I really like them I like how they turned out um, so give me one second I gotta go get my pizza ah much better all right so um, yeah so I, I also worked on mixing in a little bit of moss through here um, and the intention was that uh, when I go through and do my terrain painting which got messed up a little bit um, that I'd be able to paint with shorter long grass um, and have this start to blend in a little bit more. Didn't work out great, um, mostly because the moss that I'm using is just the wrong color. But regardless, going at, down into here, there's there's a few things that I wanted to do. So I wanted this to be sort of a, a deep pit that sort of <laughs> acts as its own kind of gravity well almost. And I wanted it to be, again, something where you go into the habitat to experience it, which is difficult with polar bears. So we've got... Um, one kind of overhang over here for you to stand on. If this were functional, then this whole wall would be viewing space. 
And then of course you have this slope down into here, which I've uh, gone ahead and reinforced because it, it felt like it needed it. So again, finally doing stuff with my paths and, and trying to make them look a little bit more creative and, and interesting and considering the weight and the physics of the things that I'm building. Um, which before, not so much. So we've got essentially three different levels. We have this upper area, and then we have this sort of central area. Because it's not getting as much light, I'm gonna say that there's probably stands of kind of weedy grass down here um, that are gonna stand tall, but most of it, like I have down here, is gonna be sand and a little bit of rock. Whereas up here, you're gonna get your kind of a softer, more normal grasses along with your ferns and things like that. And a little bit more space to put trees. Um, down here it's gonna be a little bit more rocky, a few more bushes. Things that really don't need a lot of light to survive. Except for this guy, um, this cypress, who is positioned at the right spot that I think he gets plenty of sun. Um, and some cattails, which I found that in, in a lot of builds where you're working with a river, cattails just sort of add life to them. And so this constitutes the polar bear's swimming area. I haven't bothered to decorate the, uh, the underside of it because outside of viewing it here or downloading the map, you're just not going to see it. Um, however, despite all of the space that I have added through here, it still wasn't enough. And it, it, it was because of the fact that I decorated with so many plants. Um, so I ended up expanding to add this little cave through here. And this is literally just offload so that way the polar bears think they have enough space to traverse. Uh, now, you'll notice that there are no hab uh, polar bears in this habitat. There was a, an incident, let's say, um, and all of the polar bears, I don't know how they escaped. They figured it out. Um, and so we have random polar bear stragglers all over the place. But my goal with this in particular um, is that... Let's actually go ahead and pull up the polar bear real quick. I'm gonna just move you into the habitat. And we are in um, creative mode with creative presets, so it says he's starving and dehydrated. He's fine. Um, <laughs> I just want to make that very clear. So if we go into their environment and their foliage, let's go ahead and turn off creative presets and go into challenge just for a moment. Just for a moment. Oh, he's going to die. Of course he is. <sighs> oh... Why is the game like this? I'm gonna fix something real quick. All right, I kind of fixed the problem. So yes, I know he's injured. Like I said, there was, there was a bear explosion. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. <laughs> but going into the terrain, um, so there's a little bit too much long grass in this habitat, which is fairly easy to fix of all the things. Um, you can see that we're meeting his requirements with this 401 and he's got plenty of water. Um, this habitat's really designed for two bears, and it, it basically meets kind of what they need mostly. Um, again, the terrain traversable area is going to be a little bit weird on this habitat because of the foliage and the rocks and things like that. And this is a problem that Planet Zoo runs into a lot when you're trying to make nice things, is that the bears or whatever really just struggle with navigating around things that are not opaque. Um, it's a whole thing. It's part of the reason why I bothered to do tutorials on it. Um, if we go into their environment, despite all of the foliage that we have, we actually even have a larger budget than this. Um, we could go even more. Um, we could add things like mushrooms and, you know, add more bushes and trees and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, I was quite happy with whoa, with where it was. Um, this felt really nicely planted to me, so I kind of stopped. Um, and anything else, I mean, the most realistic thing would be to add rock work or to add, you know, fungi that don't really need sunlight or things that can exist in, in full shade. So everything that is in this habitat fits perfectly and we still have more than enough coverage. And if we go down to habitat, um, or specifically to terrain, you'll notice that even though it says that he can have a, an infinite amount of snow and an infinite amount of rock. These also mean that he can have no snow and no rock. So again, as long as you're willing to balance out all of the rest of the things, you know, your, your grass, your long grass, your sand, rock, soil, you can have a green polar bear habitat. Um, now, is it a little bit depressing? Yeah. I mean, we can't ignore the fact that the ice caps are melting and this will soon enough probably be a polar bear's habitat. But I really wanted to push the bounds of what 
we normally think is possible with these animals, what, what we stereotypically presume they must live in versus what the game says that they can live in. Um, it's one of the reasons why any time that I build a lynx habitat, like you saw, I put them in castles. Um, because why not? They're happy, and they look like they're having fun. Might as well get creative with it. So that was really the goal with this habitat. I wanted to have sort of this, this stairway hole. I knew that I wanted unique viewing areas. I knew that I wanted to focus decently on the, on the rock work that I'm using, and I knew that I wanted it to be green. I did not want snow in this habitat, despite the fact that it was for polar bears, and primarily because polar bears have such a bad reputation in this game. And yet, as you can see, you know, it takes up a huge footprint. But in the context of a larger zoo, this is manageable. And it helps that, you know, a significant amount of their traversable area is spaced underground. Um, so it's, it's not taking up space that is otherwise going to, you know, disrupt the flow of the rest of your zoo. Because every, <clears throat> for the most part, zoos really don't happen underground. And this game gives us the freedom to do that. And then we get to this habitat. Um, this is the most recent, like, big project that I've taken on. And you can see how I've really, really grown as a builder. Um, and again, it's been through a lot of patience, a lot of study. I wanted to base this off of um, Alaska. And unfortunately, we don't actually have enough plants for that. There's so much more moss than you expect. But I had taken a trip up to Alaska a couple summers ago, and I came back with, you know, a, a, a lot of pictures and a lot of ideas and wanted to implement them. So this habitat, um, if you have not seen it, uh, you should go watch my uh, Elizabeth Paradovich video. It's pretty solid. Um, you'll, you'll learn about an interesting lady. Um, and in that one, you can see us actually construct this absolute monstrosity from the ground up. And this is actually for doll sheep, um, who are hopefully- nope, they're all dead. <sighs> yeah. Like I said, we had a- we had a bear explosion, we had a sheep explosion, and we had this all in creative mode, so normally the sheep are alive and fine. <laughs> but that morbid note aside. Again, I, I'm using all of the rock work techniques that I've learned over the years. So we've got this, this shale thing. Um, we're using outcroppings. We're, we're using the stone to, to not conform to the limits of the terrain in order to create these really unique and interesting spaces. Um, the balancing of different colors. So we've got the greens um, that are mixing in with the yellows and the reds from our aspens and these kind of bushy trees. Um, this little cabin, which is absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, it's got some unique designs to it, but I, I literally just googled ca cabin house and then half-assed it. <laughs> like seriously, that's all I did. Um, and just varied the roof a little bit. And could I push this further? Could I add lights and structure and supports and, you know, maybe bicycles and, you know, indicate at all that people live here? Yeah, absolutely I could. It wasn't the focus of the habitat, so I didn't. Um, so it just exists to give you an idea that a cabin in the woods exists. And I've, I've learned a technique as well that sort of helps me in, in, you know, not just getting the ideas, but in executing them. Which is that you start with molding your terrain, and then you build the rocks, and then you go from the ground up. And you, you add a tree where you know that the tree is going to be the centerpiece. And then otherwise, you, you focus on the ground cover and then add a tree where it makes sense. Um, like this whole thing. You know, this is a, I think, a better execution of what I was trying to do in Kirschwald when I was covering up that uh, water treatment facility. And there's no water treatment facility. There's nothing it's hiding. It's just here because sometimes nature does that. So this is sort of where I'm at today as a builder, um, just sort of going through, you know, the process of iterating, getting used to the game, getting used to the controls, and then afterwards seeing things that I like, mimicking them, and then understanding why they worked, um, and sort of practicing kind of an artistic eye. You know, it, it, Planet Zoo is really, if, if I can describe it any way, you know, it's it's a, an art canvas, you know. We're we're creating stories and ideally ones that don't include dead sheep. Um, but we're we're trying to create a story, a narrative. We're applying 
fake laws of physics that don't actually exist in this game. We're we're trying to replicate what exists in real life with with a keen eye. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of mimicking until you understand why that thing exists, and then once you understand how that thing works, you can apply it in new and creative ways. It's essentially you have to learn the rules to break them, but in this case the rules are wibbly wobbly and breaking them is easier than following them. But yeah, so this is where I've eventually ended up. And I do want to clarify that this is this is a habitat where I specifically sat down and I gave myself a very limited space in order to, to try and cram as much into it as possible. Um, and this was a skill that took a long time to learn. So I spent a lot of the time when I first started it off focusing on my layout and getting all of the different pieces in so that way I could just go ahead and have something to show. As time, time has gone on though, I've learned that sometimes you need to, to step back and take sort of a hybrid approach. So for example, you know, it's good to think about where the rest of this habitat would go. It's a good idea to figure out how these two things connect um, and try and build some kind of layout. But often, considering, you know, the different factors of how you're building and what you want to build, sometimes the answer is to just not build a zoo at all. You know, this would be perfect as the start for a wildlife preserve. We already have, you know, the same kind of foliage in both of these areas. Um, we've already got the start of some terrain. And honestly, if we were to just continue in this manner, there's nothing really stopping us, right? So I've often, I've, I've been finding as I continue on that it is good to get a layout down, but it's also good to then take just a, just a few hours and focus on one area in particular and build it to the absolute maximum that you can until you're done and you feel content and then move on. And if you get tired before then, take a break you know. Um, but in order to learn this, and something that I think might help you guys a lot as well, I'm going to uh, pop over to something completely different. Alrighty, so this is kind of the final thing that I want to show off. We've, we've looked at a lot of environments, and I want to finish off with a little bit of building. So this is my Raccoon Punk 2077 build, the full build of which is here on the channel. It's uh, like an hour and a half or two hours long. Um, and there's, there's no audio to it. It's one of those things that's very fun if you just need something to watch in the background. And if you just want music while you do literally anything else. But other than that, I, I don't know that it's a very good watch, <laughs> you know? Um, a friend of mine puts it on so that way he can fall asleep. And quite frankly, I think that that's a great use for it, you know? But if we look at it from the very top, we see that it's fit into this box explicitly squarely into this singular box and that was done very much so on purpose out of requirement i don't sadly i don't think that she's going to continue with them but uh another youtuber named simply savannah who if you haven't heard of them what are you doing um <laughs> a either welcome my channel or or b um welcome to to Planet Zoo, um, I recommend going and, and checking them out. Uh, they're, they're pretty cool. But every so often, they used to run contests and they would give us these borders. So the idea was that you would pick one of these borders and anything that you built had to fit within this border. You picked one of them and that was your template and you had to just maximize with the small space that you got and these are very small this square right here this is i think i i think i looked it up this is their largest template and it is 1292 square meters that's it that's all you have to work with and like i said i think this is the largest land area out of all of them um this one or this one might be just a smidge bigger maybe but not by a whole lot. You also could not let anything fall out of this border. So you had to make sure that everything fit with inside. Um, so you have to be very careful of your tolerances. But moreover, you, you're given the opportunity because you have such a limited amount of space, because you cannot leave this box or else you will be disqualified. You're given the opportunity to maximize everything that you have. And so I ended up using this opportunity to build kind of a cyberpunk city. 
And it took a, a long time because it takes so much detail and so much thought and so much planning. Um, but the first thing that I did was I went into Google and I just Googled Cyberpunk City. It's literally where I started off with. And there's actually a, a reference photo, which it, Google is ever-changing, so odds on I'm not going to find it again. That essentially... And this is this is pretty close. It's not it, but it's it's close enough. So we've got this overhanging bridge, this kind of alleyway. Um, it was a little bit more open. And I knew that I didn't want to recreate the photo one for one. Or not photo, but, but art piece. It was an art piece. I knew that I didn't want to recreate it one for one, but I wanted to take what I could. And so that started with me framing out these two areas. So I started with, this is going to be a street, this is going to be a street. And I knew that I wanted this bridge, and that meant that I had to include this building and these buildings. And I knew that I wanted some kind of something over here. Um, so this ended up becoming a convenience store. And I knew, to, I knew that I wanted to have some amount of greenery. And because of the fact that this is supposed to be like a dense, urban, like environment, you know, they completely overrun um, by urban sprawl. There wasn't a lot of places to add nature. So the way that I did it was I added this cherry tree, um, added a little planter and added these little baskets to the walls. And this is essentially a kind of community garden, and that's basically it. There's a there's a little bit more greenery in another place we'll visit, um, but that's basically all we really had time, or not time, but all we really had space for. You know, there's a little bit of moss here, it's pretty dead looking. But I knew that because, you know, we had these specific constraints of our theme, of our size, of our space, that I needed to pack a lot in. Um, and again, I knew that the foliage was just going to be non-existent. And so I needed to make the city as bright and realistic as I could. Um, so here we are down in the spa. Here's our last bit of vegetation. And that's it. And again, I'm, I'm taking a lot from places I've visited. You know, I've, I've seen... Plenty of movies of New York City, never been, um, but I've walked around plenty of different cities in my life. I've been to the good parts, I've been to the bad parts, and I wanted to channel all of that into this. When I was in Poland, you know, right near our, by our hotel, there was a, a really kind of, from the outside, it looked like a really seedy looking underground spa. Um, like you wouldn't even know that a spa was there. We only found it through Google Maps. You literally walk off the street, you go down, um, and then you're greeted with this sort of normal looking door. You walk through and you enter into a really luxurious spa. And I wanted to recreate that, um, in this. And this is not a one for one of that spa, but you know, it was kind of what I could make work with the space that we had. So if we go just through here, we're back on street level. And then after that, I thought about, okay, well, what does a spa need? You know, I want to have these underground hot springs. That sounds like something really cool. So I built around that. I knew that I wanted kind of the sandstone look. Um, I knew that I wanted smog and, and for the water to be kind of thick and look like it's made out of salt. I knew that we needed changing rooms. So I started working on those. Um, it didn't add any more detail after this. I just needed this front area to work when you peek in. And then I added, like, towel areas. And then after that, I thought that, you know, this would be more of a public space, but we need private areas. So I added these little private spas. Um, so I made a, a seal out of lights. I added more of these pools, decorated them a little bit to feel like they were actually pools. And then over here, I added sort of a sauna area. In this, actually, I ended up taking a lot of inspiration from House Flipper, of all things. So, like... All of the assets that I'm using in here are basically house flipper assets that I've made in Planet Zoo. It just worked out for, for what I was trying to do. And so that's sort of how I started to approach actually building the insides of, of buildings. You'll notice that for the most part, everything's been a shell. Um, this is me starting to branch into actually developing the interiors of rooms. Because again, I knew that I needed to maximize economy. So not all of these have anything in them. Um, but a lot of them do. So another one that I, I knew that I wanted here, I saw this kind of great thing. And I thought, you know what would be really cool? We have this bike asset in the game. 
let's uh let's do an homage to Freddie Mercury. Um, let's add a bicycle shop. It just it, it felt right. Um, it made sense. It feels kind of Pokemon almost. Like you'd come to like Unova City and you'd go get your bike. Um, I don't know if that's something that actually happens in that game, but that was kind of the feeling. Ended up developing this kind of nonsense font, font out of a combination of like Japanese kanji and Old Norse runes. Mostly because I was limited to these shapes and so I needed to figure out a quote-unquote language that would imply enough, you know. Out of this little convenience store shop that's open to the elements. Um, you know, there'd probably be like a grate that falls down from here, sort of like over on this side. And then I knew that I wanted a nightclub because no seedy part of town is complete without a nightclub. So we have these benches in the game. Um, that look like couches, and I thought, well, that's perfect. So I ended up putting in a false floor that I later ended up deleting. Uh, so that way I could position all of these. Actually, did I delete it? I don't think I did. Um, nope, I, I actually kept uh, the the pathway. So there's actual, like, path asset in here. Um, so that way I could use all of these different benches as couches. And then custom built a bar, um, tried to come up with some kind of design. Again, this is something that I think came from House Flipper as an aesthetic. And then these sta stairways were a pain in the butt to build, but they ended up being really useful because I use them all over the place now. And then worked on building a pool table, uh, mostly because, you know, I have really good childhood memories of, of going to the bar and playing pool. Now you might say, what what on earth? Why were why were you a child in a bar? And to that I say, don't ask questions. Um, <laughs> you don't, don't ask questions. Um, and I wanted to use these little Ibex signs from the, the European pack because they just remind me so much of like Jägermeister and Guinness. And that leads out onto this pathway, which it always feels like cyberpunk needs to have some kind of like Chinese or Japanese influence. And so to that, I, I added this. Um, and if I were to expand it, you know, I'd probably turn it into something like the um, the spa house from uh, Spirited Away. You know, that kind of feeling. And then after that, just sort of tried to make, you know, generic city buildings, tried to add texture where I could. And then just so many decals, so much grime. Um, I got really lucky and found this dumpster, um, which otherwise, I don't know, like it... It would have made sense, but it would have been lacking without it. And then did my best to try and use the shapes that we have to make graffiti. So like, these are all letters and numbers that I've just recolored. Um, little strips and lines and have just sort of mashed them together to try and make some facsimile of, of graffiti that, you know, if you look at it from far away, you can kind of get that feeling. Tried to add it in improbable places where like, how on earth did you even do that? Because there's always graffiti in weird places, you know? And basically, I mean, all, all of this came together by just taking time, walking around my local city, getting a lot of inspiration from other assets, you know, seeing things that I thought, hmm, that's actually really cool, I'm gonna take that. Or other areas where I'm like, you know, I wouldn't notice this if I weren't looking for it, you know, like, for example, adding drains and, you know, all the infrastructure for that. Our eyes tend to miss it, but when, when you build something like a city and it's missing, you feel like there's something empty, like, like it's off. And so just taking note of all of those little things really helps. But anyway, um, I sure hope that this has been useful to some of you guys. This has been an enormous project. Like, the recording time is just so long, and, you know, all of the stuff that I've showcased today is stuff that has... I've been building since... You know, I, I got back into the game in 2000... or uh, 2021, and it's 2024 now. So this has been the progress of, you know, years to get to this point. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that that doesn't discourage you, that, you know, you will... You will find things that work. You will eventually learn to innovate and to see all of these different little things that you would otherwise ignore and then figure out how to incorporate them, you know? Little awnings that most people would never pay attention to, but that just add a little bit more life. Little details and things like that that just sell help to sell the build. And then taking the time to actually implement them and focus on, you know, the building a small area until you feel like it's complete, you know? 
So, thank you very much for joining me. I am gonna let you guys go. I, I need a break. <laughs> I need a little bit of a break. Yeah, I hope this was helpful. Y'all stay safe, have fun, and of course, happy building.